Good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Aranda with Graybar, and I'd like to welcome you to Graybar's G2 Talk presentation on HD Base T, Structured Connectivity for Digital AV. This talk is part of a webinar series we offer each month for our data communications customers. We have a great discussion lined up for you today, but before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you're one of the first 50 people who joined the presentation today, you'll receive a coupon for a free cup of coffee, courtesy of Graybar, as a thank you for your time today. In addition, this presentation is worth one Bixi credit, so if you stay online for the entire presentation, you can download the Bixi certificate right from the platform. You'll just click on the, on the ribbon icon shown here, and you'll be able to download the certificate. Another reason to stay on for the entire program today is that you can win a TrueLink HD Base T receiver kit. Uh, this is a $500 value, and if you stay on for the entire presentation, your name will be automatically entered to win. We'll announce the lucky winner during the Q&A segment. Uh, speaking of which, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box for Q&A. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation, and we'll address as many questions as we can. Uh, lastly, our G2 Talks are all archived on graybar.com to be able to see this presentation again or recommend it to others. So we're happy to team up with Legrand today. As a data communications distributor, Graybar works alongside Legrand to provide the latest in audio and video technology to help you prepare for the future. You can visit graybar.com to learn more about our solutions. And I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Joe Cornwall. Joe describes himself as a technology evangelist for Legrand. He's the guy responsible for predicting the future and making it happen. Joe is a recognized industry educator, author, and presenter, and has held management and technical positions in commercial, residential, and broadcast market sectors in his 30-plus year career. Joe is a 2016 Infocom faculty member, 2014 Infocom Educator of the Year award recipient, and frequent presenter at Big C, AIA, NSCA, Infocom, and industry events across North America and the world. As a graduate of University of Cincinnati, Joe holds a number of industry certifications that you can check out in his bio. Uh, so without further delay, I'd like to turn it over to Joe. Take it away, Joe. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your busy day to join us for this webinar. This is actually one of my favorite topics, looking into HD base T and AV extension and comparing and contrasting that. And, and I'd like to start with just this one thought. When we start thinking in terms of AV, um, it's not uncommon for a lot of folks to just assume that at some point in the not-so-distant future, everything AV will be part of IT. Everything will be done over the network. But I suggest a different way of looking at this. I feel that AV is that last 100 meters of connectivity from the network drop to the human imagination. And when we think about it that way, I think we have a different way of designing and, uh, uh, and coming to grips with what AV is and with what it's going to be. So let's get started with understanding HD base T, structured connectivity for the digital AV world. What we're going to talk about today, a few different things, is digital video in and of itself. What exactly are long distances for digital video and, and what do we have to carry? What, is the, what are the challenges of these connections? And what is the actual payload? What, is, what are we trying to do, deal with when we look at uh, digital video? Because it's not just video. We're talking about data sets that can exceed uh, certainly 10 gigabits per second. And in some instances, in the not so distant future, we'll be looking at close to 20 gigabits per second uh, for uncompressed digital video and audio capability. So it's important that we understand exactly what's going through all of these connections in order to get a better feel for where we are. So let's start by looking at this simple fact. We have to go back to the past, really, to understand where we're going in the future. And we first have to understand the difference between analog connections and digital connections. And we must always keep in mind this one absolute truth. Digital signals do not flow through wire or fiber. What flows through wire or fiber is an analog representation of a digital signal, which is a digital representation of an analog event. So we have physics to worry about. Well, what's the biggest difference between analog and digital? Analog is continuous in nature. It never stops. If we had a razor blade that we could cut time with, we could cut analog signals down to smaller and smaller pieces of time. And in fact, we could actually comb into the noise floor for more and more information. In fact, 
in theoretical terms, analog has essentially an infinite bandwidth. Of course, this isn't true in practice, but once again, if we look at this just in terms of uh, uh, the way that it operates, if we look at this as an intellectual exercise, analog is infinite in bandwidth. But if we think in terms of what happens with analog when we make copies, when we transport signals, we get noise, we get generational loss, we get intermodulation noise, we get distortions. The signal is very, very delicate. So years ago, we created a method of going to a digital signal. And when we go from analog to digital, we trade this essentially infinite bandwidth for an essentially infinite noise floor, meaning that we have a more robust package that we can send along our structured wiring from point to point. The advantages of digital signals, of course, are that they use discrete representations of information. And these are two vectors that we are all familiar with. We call this the sampling rate, how quickly the samples are taken, how many times per second we look at it, a sound, for example, and in a compact disc, this, is, this of course happens uh, 44,100 times per second minimally and, and can be much higher of a sampling rate than that. And then we look at the bit depth, which is how many ones and zeros describe the information. It's this combination of ones and zeros, this binary nature of a digital signal that, it, that defines its finite resolution. So if we think in terms of a digital system, if we had a digital system with just four bits, then it could either be zero, 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 all the way up to one, 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 one. But in that system, there's only two to the fourth capabilities. So there, there aren't that many possibilities for us to define it. When we look at 16-bit systems, we have over 65,000 possible choices. So keep this in mind. In a binary system, anytime you add one bit, you double the total amount of information. So as we go from an 8-bit system, for example, which has 256 possibilities, that's 2 to the 8th power, if we went to a 9-bit system, we would end up with 512 possible states. Every time we had a single bit, we double the amount of information the system can handle. And the, the only thing that can disturb this conversation of digital signals is when we get enough noise in the analog carriage through the structured cabling that the digital system can't recognize the difference between a one and a zero. The symbol is being misinterpreted. And at this point, unlike analog, where you can get sparklies or noise or ghosts, or you can have something that's there that you can recover, in the digital world, our signal is either perfectly rendered or completely lost. And there's really no place in between that we can be. So it's very important when we start talking in terms of designing a system or installing a system or integrating devices that we keep this in mind with digital signals, that we have a digital cliff. We must always be aware of where we are on that uh, road to the digital cliff. When we think in terms of the analog signal running through, for instance, category cable or running through an HDMI wire or running through a multi-mode fiber, these are all analog signals where you have amplitude, so in other words, the signal goes to a high voltage or a higher amplitude or a lower voltage or a lower amplitude, and that allows a, a detector to determine a one from a zero, and in this way, we take this analog transport and we reconvert it to true digital programming information through a true, true digital language. When this happens, we're utilizing an I pattern inside of the cable. So what you can see on your right-hand side of your screen is an example of an I pattern. And this is true in network connectivity. It's true in HDMI or DisplayPort. This is, this is true for all digital signals. So what you can see here is as the voltage goes high or the voltage goes low, if we were to able to overlap these signals, they would form kind of the outline of an I. And in the center of the I, you can see the pupil of the I. Well, that is the detecting portion of the signal. And to the extent that the signal has jitter, perhaps because we have a characteristic impedance mismatch, we have a poorly installed cable, we have a cable with an exceeded bend radius or an improperly connected uh, termination on it, as we introduce jitter or noise, it impinges on the pupil of the eye. And just like when the pupil of your eye is impinged upon, we can no longer see the difference between ones and zeros, and this puts us on this path to the digital cliff. So keep this in mind, we are dealing with very delicate signals, but we only have to determine a one from a zero, which does make it easy to do this by computing power. But when we go from uh, audio to video, we're dealing with huge amounts of information that we have to deal with, um, you know, an order of magnitude, more ones and zeros to make up a picture as possible. And anytime you're talking about voltages, 
or amplitude going through copper, we have to look at the physics of wire. And we would be remiss to not remember that we have Ohm's law that is part of this equation. So we have to keep in mind that the longer this piece of wire, the longer the piece of category cable, the greater resistance we're going to have to deal with. Um, and then therefore we have to be thinking in terms of the cross-sectional area of the wires. This is a very similar argument or very similar uh, knowledge to what we use when we're putting together a LAN system. The longer the, the cable that, that we're going to have, the, the greater amount of copper, the more power we want to go through that copper, perhaps because we're using PoE, the more we have to pay attention to heat dissipation and the actual internal resistance of the wire so we don't have a voltage drop which causes heat to build up in that wire. We have to be thinking in terms of material composition. Do we in fact have a copper cable? Um, this is no place for us to be looking at um, solutions that involve aluminum or copper clad steel or things like that, which we sometimes find in the broadcast kind of a sector. And when we think in terms of Ohm's law, we have to think both in terms of a DC circuit emulation where a pure resistance causes an independent voltage drop not related to the frequency. We have to think of something called um, uh, impedance, so the characteristic impedance of the connections. The characteristic impedance, for example, if we have a 100 ohm characteristic impedance or a 90 ohm characteristic impedance in the case of um, an HDMI cable, as right, so between the present and HDMI cable, that characteristic impedance is an effect of the circuit. It's an effect of the fact that we're sending an AC signal through it. And to the extent that a cable is improperly connected, we don't have the APAC connection properly um, uh, terminated on the end, or we have exceeded a bend radius, or any of a number of other physical malaise that can affect the way we make these connections. Anytime we have to deal with that, we have to think of it as a partially soldered or one-way mirror. So here comes the signal, let's say from our Blu-ray player, and it comes to this bad connection, and part of the signal is reflected back to the Blu-ray player, while some of it goes on to the display, to the projector or TV. You'll get an image, but that reflected signal that went back is now mixing with a new signal that's coming out of the player, and it's going to cause phase-related anomalies. It's going to increase the noise until eventually the signal completely fails and we don't have it. So we have to worry about these electrical parameters of the connection, particularly um, the impedance, which are elements of capacitance and ductance, as well as the actual resistance of the wire. All of these have to be taken into account with the same care when we're talking about particularly HD base T as we would put into the design of a 10 gigabit network system because with HD base T, we are in fact dealing with 10 gigabits per second of uncompressed digital content. So looking at this characteristic impedance again, and I don't want to get too far into the electrical theory behind this, but it's important to understand that it really is uh, represented by uh, inductance in series and capacitance and parallel with the load, which can roll off both the higher and the lower frequencies impinging upon that eye pattern. So therefore, it's very important when we start creating HDBHT systems that we follow along with the same TIA requirements for precise constant conductor spacing um, and precise twists pitch uh, per inch so that these cables can't pass the signal. We're talking about something that is every bit as delicate as a 10 gigabit per second LAN. But we have one additional problem we sometimes have to worry about. With AV products, it's not unusual for us to be in a situation where we may want to connect or disconnect devices. And of course, when we're talking about structured cabling in the LAN environment, we always use a solid copper conductor. But sometimes we want to use a uh, braided copper conductor, perhaps for that little patch cord that comes out into the device that we're plugging to, for instance, your, uh, your laptop or something along those lines. That's a challenging situation because we do have to think that at the very, very high frequencies we're dealing with, certainly in excess of um, uh, 75 megahertz for the most basic of digital video signals, and oftentimes well in advance, or, uh, in advance of that, we have to be worried about skin effect. Skin effect is where the signals want to travel on the outside edge of the copper, not utilizing the entire depth of the copper. And therefore, we have to have, from a design perspective, a balance between the copper gauge and the effect that we're going to have on the actual signal we're dealing with. So it's a balancing act when we start looking at something called POH. We'll talk about POH. This is power over HD base T, which is, in essence, four pair PoE. And we'll touch on that briefly as we go through this presentation. So, we now know a little bit about the wiring. 
for example, we know that we have to maintain the characteristic incidence, we have to maintain the kind of environment, we have to maintain the kind of noise floor um, that we do when we're installing a LAN type system. How is the data, how is the content of the payload of HD base T different than what we would typically put over a network? How are these things different? Well, in addition to not following the OSI model and not having the ability to have checksums or packets and uh, to avoid this, we're dealing with something that has incredibly low tolerances for latency. The signal has to get there on time and there's no error correction involved in it. We have even a little bit more than that. We have several different elements of the digital payload that we have to account for. Let's start with this. First and foremost, it's very important that we recognize that any time we're dealing with video, we're dealing with an additive color system. The additive color model has been around in video since 1953. Well, the first one from black and white broadcast television to color broadcast television. And this uh, additive video system is based on three colors, red, green, and blue. And indeed, if you were to take three stage lights with a red, green, and blue filter and you were to put them all together so they shined on top of each other as the illustration shows, you would perceive that as white light. Every image you've ever seen from every projector, every computer monitor, every television consists of red, green, and blue colors added in very specific uh, percentages to give you the effect of seeing white or daylight type colors and all of the other colors of the spectrum. In fact, video operates on an 8-bit system, 256 specific shades of each of the three primary colors. So there's 256. 56 shades of red, of blue, and of green. And if you added those together, 256 times 256 times 256, you would quickly come up with a number of 16.77 million. That's called true color, and that's the amount of colors that even the most basic high-definition digital video system can produce. Additionally, you may occasionally see the uh, initials YPRPB or YCRCB, and that indicates that we're sending the signal in a luminance and chrominance format. Not really important for the elements of this discussion. It's just two different ways of handling chroma subcarrier. We're going to talk about chrom chroma subcarrier just very briefly in a second here. It is important to recognize that bandwidth is directly proportional to visual detail. So if I want to go from a 720p image past the 1080p image, and I want to start looking at 2160p, which you may recognize as ultra HD, commonly called 4K video, well, to do that, we have to have more bandwidth. It's easy to think of digital video as a triangle with bandwidth and image quality uh, and detail or resolution forming the three, the three uh, corners of the triangle. And to the extent that I, for instance, want to increase the amount of resolution, the amount of pixels, then I either have to also increase the bandwidth of the system or decrease um, some other elements. So we always have to deal with these three things being in balance. Bandwidth is proportion to detail, and amplitude, or bit tuft, is directly proportion of the color saturation. You may have heard a phrase, deep color. This is where we go from an 8-bit color, perhaps to 10 or 12-bit color, to improve our color rendition from 17 million colors to, uh, to perhaps a billion or 2 billion colors. Very important, as an example, in medical imaging, where we want to make very, very sure that our surgeons are seeing exactly the right color before they take out a part that maybe you wanted to keep around for a little while longer. So red, green, and blue is part of it. And one of the things that came out of the 1953 move towards color television was this idea of chroma subsampling. And I want to point this out because this has an effect on our design that we have to keep in mind. The human eye has an uncanny ability to make up what it cannot necessarily perceive. In fact, we all have a blind spot in our eyes, something that I demonstrate in a lot of demonstrations. But one of the facts is that since you were a little child, every television show you've ever watched, every DVD or Blu-ray you've ever rented, every streaming thing that you've ever seen on Netflix was delivered to you in a format known as 420. In this format, we actually cut the color information by more than half compared to the black and white. Now, you're probably thinking, well, I didn't see a problem with the color. It looked great to me. And indeed, you did, because your eyes don't see as much detail in color as they do in black and white. The problem, however, lies with computers. A computer graphics card cannot make this chroma subsampling move. In other words, if I'm creating something on my laptop, I'm creating it in a true RGB environment where red, green, and blue are given equal standard, equal amounts of bandwidth. 
and that would be a 444 subsampling rate. So, without getting into all the details of chroma subsampling, let's put it this way. If you take 4 plus 4 plus 4, that equals 12. If you take 4 plus 2 plus 0, that equals 6. Therefore, it's easy to uh, understand that a 420 chroma subsampling takes about half the bandwidth of a 444 RGB full sampling bandwidth that would come out of computer originated graphics. So, for instance, if I were installing a system for a university or a college and it were going into a computer lab where we were le learning how to do computer graphics, or we're going into an art history lab where we're going to be dealing with highly detailed photographs of uh, artwork, which are going to be rendered in a 444 environment from a computer, I need to make sure that I'm accounting for additional bandwidth above and beyond what I would normally expect simply because the system is 1080p or 2160p in resolution. So this is a, uh, another element besides resolution. That said, we also have to concern ourselves when we're talking about the digital video payload, not just with the black and white color information, the bit depth information, the chroma uh, subsampling, but we also have to concern ourselves with digital audio. Who wants to watch silent movies anymore? They went out of um, uh, popularity for a reason. So now audio does not follow a separate path. There is really no place left for us to be designing systems where audio is carried on a 3.5 millimeter shielded twisted pair and video is carried by a separate path, a separate pathway. In today's digital world, digital audio is embedded inside of that digital video content. In fact, we use an area called the horizontal ancillary channel. So all of our digital audio is part of the video signal, and therefore we have to be thinking in terms of um, digital audio being better to recover that digital audio at certain points. And this is the way HD base T works. It sends everything through the same pipe. One pipe carries gas and water and oil and all of the things that you need to make the signal work at the far end, and then we separate them once again. One of the other elements that we have to think about in terms of our digital payload, and all of these are things that have to go through that HD base T link, is the need for digital rights protection, also known as HDCP, High Bandwidth Digital Content Protection. You may have seen this if you ever tried to put, for instance, a Blu-ray DVD into the uh, DVD um, tray of your computer and then play it on your um, on your, your, your monitor at work or something like that. Perhaps you had a screen that came up and said you need HDCP or if you've been to a job site where somebody didn't account for HDCP and all of a sudden, you know, everything works beautifully until somebody plugs in um, a specific computer that requires an HDCP environment and the system doesn't work. We have to be thinking in terms of HDCP as an element of the digital payload. So whatever solution we select to carry all of this data from one end of a plant or an installation to another, it must include digital video, must include digital audio, it must include digital rights protection, um, and we must remember that we cannot take digital rights protection out of the equation. We're not allowed to circumvent this. The system also must have system control. Just think about this. We're talking about extending digital video signals 20 meters or beyond, all the way up to 100 meters and beyond. We're certainly not going to walk 100 meters to go and turn the projector on. We need an ability to turn it on. Often this time is, this, oftentimes this is done via RS-232. But let's not lose sight of the fact that embedded into HDMI itself, and with HD base T, we are almost specifically talking about an HDMI input to an HD base T transmitter, running the signal over category cables for up to 100 meters, and then converting it back to HDMI. CEC is a control system, a control capability built into HDMI. We want to be able to extend that. This is the system that allows you. Perhaps at your home you have, for example, a, a Sony DVD player and a Sony TV, so you know that the TV and the DVD player are off, but you hit the button to open the drawer on the DVD player, you put in a disc and hit play, it'll turn the TV on and go to the right input. That same capability is true in all commercial applications as well, and that CEC signal, which enables that, is also part of the HDHT standard. So this is a feature that's designed to allow enabled devices to command and control each other without user intervention. And it can make your system very simple and intuitive to operate. 
Of course, where would we be when we think about system control if we didn't also think about the clicker, the infrared remote control that we might have? And of course, in the 21st century, we have interactive capabilities, which means we have to have bi-directional system control, typically carried at USB on USB 2.0 level speeds. And USB would be a, a great topic for us to perhaps uh, uh, explore in a future G2 talk, and we'll look at doing that. Just keep in mind, if it's interactive, you must have USB as part of it. USB, RS-232, CEC, and infrared remote control can all be handled by an HD base T link. And here's the good news. Oftentimes, you don't have to choose which one of them you're going to use for your system. HD base T can actually handle all of them at the same time, depending on which um, devices you select for your application. Something else that we have to worry about when we're talking about the digital audio video payload that we're moving to point to point is digital video, digital audio, digital rights management, control, but also the entire category of connectivity known as DDC or EDID, extended definition ID data. This is what happens when your television and your source device, your Blu-ray player or your computer and your projector, have a hardware, hardware handshake and begin to operate when you plug them in. Your computer sends a signal, and if you're obviously you're watching this webinar on a computer, it's sending a signal to your monitor, and it's asking the monitor, what kinds of images can you display? What resolution? 720p, 1080p, 1080i, 2160p, so forth and so on. What color renditions can you handle in terms of chroma subcarrier? 420, 421, 444, so forth and so on. Can you handle extended definition um, uh, colors such as deep color, XDYCC? All of this information is carried in the DDC channel, and this must also be propagated across the HD base T link. So there's a lot of things happening. We have a complex signal, which is an analog representation of a digital representation of an analog event. And when we look at the payload that we're sending over this, it's not just video, but it's video and audio. It's digital rights management control, even power, as well as DVC information. So HD based T is a very, very powerful standard. Of course, it was announced as an IEEE standard uh, in, um, uh, in I think it was March 2015. So it's an official IEEE global standard as of right now. Now, we we'll talk about HD based T. I think it's important that we understand what exactly it is we're talking about, right? So what is this base T thing? And this is second nature to um, those of us who make our living in the land space, but base T has a very simple explanation. Uh, and here's how it goes. We have two ways that we can send a signal across a piece of wire, or wirelessly across radio waves, or across a piece of fiber using light. We can either use baseband. And baseband means that the signal starts at the lowest frequency that it needs and it sends up to the highest frequency that it needs and occupies the entirety of the cable or the link that we're using. So baseband denotes, or base denotes a baseband transmission. So we talked about HD base T. We now know it's a baseband transmission, therefore nothing else can be on the cable. And T denotes that it's going to be on twisted pair, as in 10 gig base T is a baseband twisted pair connection for 10 gigabit Ethernet. Similar idea. So if it weren't for baseband, well, is there an opposite to this? Well, yes, there is. It's called PATS band. Um, just so that you recognize, right, PATS band is what we would call AM radio or FM radio or broadcast television, in which case we take an originating signal and you see a sine wave on your screen. And then for in the case of amplitude modulation, we would modulate the amplitude, the volume of the waveform, and then we can recapture the original signal. If you look at the example of FM frequency modulation, we're modulating the frequency, higher and lower frequencies of a carrier wave, and we can recapture the signal. In HD base T, as is true in LAN, we use something called pulse amplitude modulation, where the volume or the power, the amplitude, if you will, of the individual pulses representing the ones and zeros are modulated to give us back the original frequency, which, by the way, is that high pattern frequency. So we use pulse amplitude modulation. The biggest difference is on your LAN, you're using something called TAM4, which is a four position pulse amplitude modulation. In HD base T, we're using TAM16. And I'll talk about PAM16 um, and how difficult that is to, to capture uh, a little bit later on in this presentation. So 
once again, HD base tape, the newest IEEE standard. Uh, the standard actually describes the way that chipsets interact with each other, so this is a global standard. You can find products from virtually every manufacturer. Of course, at Legrand, we are an HD base T adopter, which means that we've been part of this product category since its inception in 2010. Let's take a look at the way we can carry these signals. So when we look at a signal that's being sent through HDMI, HDMI uses a system known as TMDS, Transition Minimized Differential Signaling. This is a variation on something called 8-bit to 10-bit line coding, or 8D-10D coding, which is also used in all lands, and it was really originated in the late 1960s and early 1970s as part of the methodology for doing telephone switching systems. When we first went digital, that's where most of this technology originated. So when we start saying, well, how can I take an HDMI signal that's covering my 1080p high-definition image, and I'm in my office, and I'm going from my computer to a projector in a meeting room, and the routing means that that cable has to be more than 20 meters long. HDMI should not be run more than 20 meters without doing something to protect the signal because of the collapse of that uh, digital eye pattern that we looked at a little bit earlier. So you go online, you go to your friends at Gray Bar, and you may find that they have several different solutions, and one of them would be something called TMDS over Twisted Pair. It may not be labeled like this, but oftentimes you'll see this, and a number of manufacturers make this. This is denoted by the fact that typically it requires two category cables to run this signal and not one. Not always. Some companies are manufacturing this over a single category cable, but this is not HD based T. TMDS over Twisted Pair um, is sending the TMDS, which is a red, green, blue, and sync signal, RGBS, coded in something called TMDS, Transition Minimized Differential Signaling, over that category cable. So if you think about it, right, RGBS, red, green, blue, sync, four twisted pairs and a piece of Cat5 or Cat6, it's a perfect matchup. That's all we have to do really is change the connections on the end. And in this case, the second cable that we're utilizing here would be the cable that is carrying the hot plug, the power for uh, uh, hardware handshake, um, the EDID information, the HDCP information, all of that's carried on the second category cable. And we're not making any fundamental changes to the signal. We're doing some equalization and some jitter correction, but essentially we're taking the TMDS signal from our HDMI cable and adapting it to the twisted pair environment. And this works wonderfully, and it's inexpensive, but it has a hidden cost. And that cost is that the quality of the signal, the bandwidth of the signal, is inversely proportional to the distance. So think about it this way. If I put this into my office, and it works beautifully for 1080p so that I can go to my projector in my office, and I'm running this over 50 feet of Category 5 e I want to take this to a different space, and I'm going to install it in a different office, but now I have 100 feet. The exact same devices may not support 1080p at 100 feet, even though they supported it at 50 feet. At 100 feet, they may only support 720p. Um, and if I start going into deep color or go into a 444 color space, I might find out that it was perfect 1080p at 50 feet, but in a 444 color space with higher qual uh, color quality requirements, it can only support the signal at 60 feet. So we begin to see lower and lower performance levels as the link length gets longer and longer. This is a characteristic of utilizing a TMDS over twisted pair carriage for digital video signals. So once again, an example might work beautifully at 60 meters for 720p, 25 meters for 1080p, or only 20 meters if we go to a higher bit depth in color. HD base T doesn't in, uh, impose such restrictions on the way the system operates. It is fully capable of 2160p, that is 4K video, ultra HD, at up to 100 meters while operating in something called a five-play mode, and we'll talk about this. HD base T was created just six short years ago by the HD base T Alliance, and the 2.0 standard was finalized in August of 2013. Almost every HD base T solution supports Ultra HD at 420 color space, and that means that almost all of them will support 1080p in a 444 color space. And each of these systems is designed to operate in as many as eight hops of 100 meters each. Now, I will give you a warning. I've never personally seen 800 meters of HD base T operational, 
mostly because we've never hooked up eight individual hops to see it work. But right here in my home office, in my home lab, I actually do have a system operating with two 100 meter links and it operates flawlessly. And in our labs at the ground, we've had uh, three and even four link systems put together. So you do have the ability to go 100 meters, at which point you would go into another transmit receive module to extend it, you can go up to another 100 meters. So we can break this out and do a few things. HD base T is so powerful because unlike TMDS push technology, HD base T really does address all of the elements of our digital video payload. That is to say that if we have an HD base T transmitter and an HD base T receiver, and by the way, the transmitter can be built into a device. Oftentimes the transmitter is a separate TX and it may be located, for instance, on a conference table or in an equipment rack. And we're going with an HDMI cable into an HDMI uh, tabletop box. And then we're making the connection to the HD base T transmitter. We then go over a category cable to an HD base T display where we can either have a receiver or we can have the receiver built into the display. An example is Epson projectors have an HD base T receiver built right into their projectors, and you can utilize a Legrand HD base T transmitter to talk directly to the uh, Epson projector without having to have another box at the far end. Regardless, HD base T will support something called five play, which is to say that over this single category table, the system will support digital video, once again, typically we look at it as 1080p in a 444 color space, but HD base T systems, with the exception of HD base T light, which I'll talk about in a minute, will support up to 4K in a 420 color space. The system is also designed to support all formats of embedded audio, so easily up to seven channels of embedded audio inside the system, and also simultaneously we can support fast Ethernet. That is that we can have a signal that's 100 megabits per second Ethernet. And an example of this would be, let's say we're doing an installation in a, uh, um, in a, in a high school and we have a, a network drop by the teacher's desk, but we don't have a network drop in the middle of the ceiling where the projector is going to be mounted. We could utilize HD base T to extend the network drop from the teacher's desk to the projector over the HD base T link at 100 megabits per second, thereby allowing not so much for streaming video and things like that, but allowing us to pull the projector for its operational attributes and figure out when the filters and light bulbs need to be changed. The system also supports control. Once again, it supports CEC. It supports infrared remote control. So you can have an IR flasher and repeater, or you can have controls built into it. For instance, using one of our control systems can operate over HD base T. Um, you can also have CEC or USB HD base T, depending on the products you select, can handle any and all of these even simultaneously. And HD base T was the first implementation of 4K or PoE, allowing us to deliver up to 100 watts over the category cable. And you can actually go out right now and buy, for instance, a 50 inch flat panel 1080p display that has an HD base T input and does not require a connection to an AC mains. In a strange twist of fate, you're going to pay more for a TV without a power supply than you will for a TV with a power supply. But if you have to do a low voltage display for digital signage, that product actually is available. Let's take a look at what else HD base T does. Power over HD base T. This is a fascinating opportunity because this is where PoE is going to go to. And when we look at HD base T, we are already immediately talking about four pair PoE, where we're dealing with somewhere between 50 and 57 volts DC power supply over each of the four pairs, providing about a half an amp um, or, uh, per pair, uh, one amp for every two pairs, which can give us up to 100 watts. Now, some of that will de be dissipated in the form of heat, so the standard caveats we have to think about in PoE are still in play. And if we really want the best performance, if we're going to utilize power over HD base T, we should be thinking in terms of cables that are optimized not only for my signal, but also for power over PoE. Um, and of course, there are a number of those. We'll talk about cable selection uh, very, very shortly here. So here's an image, and this image was actually very, very hard for us to capture, and I brought it here for you because I wanted to give you an idea of what's happening inside of this category cable when we're dealing with HD base T. HD base T, once again, uses PAM 16 symbols, where each symbol is transmitted using one of 16 discrete voltage levels, each of those voltage levels representing as many as four bits of data. Therefore, we can actually have a 10.2 gigabit per second 1080p image going through a CAT5e that's only rated 
to 100 megahertz would only be typically used in a 1 gigabit LAN. It's because we're using all of the pairs simultaneously in parallel. Now, that said, I want to point out that as you're looking at this, this is a complex waveform. Any um, alteration of this waveform would close the eye pattern and the system would become unpredictable. That's not what we want. How do we ensure that we have good connectivity in an HD base T solution? Well, every HD base T commercial installation, I believe without exception, should be done utilizing one of two types of category cables. Either an FUTP CAT6, or maybe a CAT6A if you think in terms of future scalability. So we're dealing with a shielded, a foiled, unshielded twisted pair, so an FUTP cable, which means that we now have to have shielded connectors. We have to have shielded wall plates and shielded jumpers coming to our devices. That's one way to do it, and that's the industry standard, and it's utilized by almost every manufacturer, from Legrand to Crestron and Extron and so forth. There is another solution, and that is to utilize an unshielded twisted pair, CAT6 or CAT6A, um, that utilizes a discontinuous shield technology. Now, there's one company that recently bought this, brought this out. This is available through uh, your friends at Graybar, uh, and that is Superior Essex with their um, uh, XP um, Category 6A, which is a discontinuous shield product. They also have a traditional FUTP, and they also have a traditional CAT 5E called PowerWise that are designed for this. But the 10 gain XP is a discontinuous shield, which means that it is optimized for 10, bit, 10 gigabit applications, but I don't have to use shielded connections or shielded uh, wall plates or shielded jumpers on the end. I actually protect the signal from the radio frequency interference by virtue of this very special discontinuous shielding that's internal uh, to the system. And this has been approved by HD Base T LLC. So this is a certified product, and once again, it is available to you through Graybar, and it's an ideal solution to use with any of Legrand's HD Base T transmitter and receiver sets. By the way, we'll be giving away one of those transmitter receiver sets in just a few moments. So let's take a look at some of the variations on HD Base T. Sometimes we don't need to be able to carry power and control and all of these other things. Sometimes we don't need a full 100 meters. In that case, HD Base T does have a less expensive chipset that manufacturers can utilize to create a slightly less expensive, yet nonetheless very powerful and dependable product. We call this HD Base T Lite. So with HD Base T Lite, instead of 100 meters, we really only suggest 60 meters. We still suggest that you stay with all commercial applications with a shielded FUTP CAT6 or a discontinuous shield UUTP CAT6 or CAT6A um, to get your best performance and make sure your system is scalable in all environments. These systems do support Ultra HD 4K video 2160p in the 420 color space. So this is an ideal solution for that 20 or 30 meter run that you have to put in just to get inside of a conference room. For more sophisticated systems, understand that HD Base T is not limited to copper. Um, HD Base T can also be HD Base F or HD Base OF, which would be an optical fiber, and this can utilize either a multi-mode or single mode, depending on the technology that you need to install, and this will allow transmission over much longer distances. You'll be using that uh, PAM 16 capability still supporting 4K Ultra HD, but now we can go hundreds of meters. In fact, we can go as uh, much as 800 meters over an OM4 multi-mode fiber and as much as 10 kilometers um, over a single mode fiber on this kind of an application. So HD Base T has stepped out of the strictly uh, copper environment and it is available over fiber. It's also available in HD Base T Lite. So we have a little cousin and a bigger cousin for both of these. You know, you have to ask yourself, well, are there other ways that we can do some extension methods? What does HD Base T compete with? Was, was there ever anything else? Well, one of the things that we have actually is a system that we think about it, we watch every day. Cable television is a modulated taskband, so they're making channels of every video signal that we want to have and sending it over a piece of coaxial cable. And incidentally, they're also sending very fast internet capability over a single piece of coaxial cable. Digital television. Um, this is not the same as AV over IP. This is a modulated passband system. So this would be an MATV head end. And once again, we have training on that, and perhaps we'll be able to share that with you at a future date. Um, modulated passband can be a very good solution, and I'll give you an example of where I used it. When I consulted on one particular system, we had to put 
50-inch high-definition video panels and a series of elevators for digital signage. And we only had, because elevator manufacturers don't ask you what wire you want, they tell you what wire you can use, we had a dual shield RG6. We created a modulated passband system. We put in a CMTS, cable motor termination system, which allowed us to bridge to the LAN, to the VLAN they were using for their digital signage. And every TV, and every elevator got multiple signals that were high definition video. And every one of those panels was also controllable by the LAN. So this is an important technique quite a bit more expensive than HD base T, but if you need it, it is an alternative for certain applications. And of course, where would we be if we didn't mention this? Legrand is also a manufacturer of video over IP. Now, this is a really common way to do video distribution in many uh, commercial systems. I think it's very important for us to recognize that it is fundamentally different than HD base T. Video over IP actually runs through the LAN, through the switches, it is an OSI model system um, that operates on, uh, certainly inside of a, a single facility, out to layer three. Um, it has uh, QoS capabilities. It uses internet protocol. Uh, and it takes space on the LAN. HD base T is a dedicated channel between display and device. So although it utilizes the same structured connectivity as a LAN, it does not touch the LAN other than perhaps as an extension at the last 100 meters of the data drop to other devices, as I said at the very beginning. So video over IP and HD base T can look very, very similar. And this is, if you're on this call, this is a tremendous advantage to you because most of us on this call are very familiar with installing LAN systems. We're very familiar with um, TIA requirements to make sure that we have the right kind of performance in a 1 gig or a 10 gig environment. And therefore, HD base T is a very simple step for us to be able to expand our capabilities within the marketplace. Video over IP being on the LAN can be an outstanding solution. And in fact, most production facilities, and I'm thinking now of the places where they make the TV shows or produce the content, use extensive video over IP, but keep in mind they're using a, ten, a dedicated 10 gigabit per second LAN to be able to move the and transport this content where it needs to be, whether that's dedicated hardware or a petitioned VLAN. So video over IP, we have a lot more moving parts. We have a network director who needs to be involved. We have to calculate quality of service. We have to calculate end nodes. We have to know, determine how many people are going to be involved. Whereas HD base T is really designed to send a signal from a source to a display, or in the case of, let's say, a, a matrix solution system, such as a Harman Kardon AMX or a Crestron or an Extron type system, or even the multi HD based T solutions that Legrand sells, we have, for instance, at Legrand, through available through Graybar, you'd be able to plug in one or two HDMI sources, go to a, an HD based T format, and then distribute that to four or six or eight or 10 or 12 displays because I want to do perhaps digital signage in a logistics facility or something like that. It will, the end result will be similar to video over IP, but we're not on the LAN. Whereas video over IP, streaming media, which is essentially what Netflix is and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Amazon, uh, um, those programs that you're binging on over the weekends, those are video over IP. We can certainly do it that way, but now we're dealing with an entirely different discipline and a whole lot more questions. So big difference between when we look at modulated systems, cable television, video over IP, HD base T is an HDMI extension topology that utilizes similar structured cabling to the network in order for the system to operate. So I'm going to make sure we have plenty of time for some questions here. Let me wrap up this conclusion, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about our own HD base T solution that we'll provide for you for being on this webinar and joining us today. Of course, the conclusion is the place where you get tired of thinking. It might be the place where my voice gets a little bit tired of speaking, having just taught I don't know how many classes at the fabulous Infocom show last week, and I hope you were there. If you did, thank you for attending, and I hope you were in one of my classes. Let me just take a moment right now to tell you um, one of the things that Graybar is going to be doing on this webinar. We are giving away an HD base T transmitter receiver set. So this is a solution that would allow you to extend HD base T um, as much as 100 meters. This is designed to carry an 
1080p signal with embedded audio and um, the, the, the digital rights management and the content control and all the other things we talked about over a category table. Once again, I do recommend a discontinuous shield TAC 6A as the ideal solution for most installations. Any commercial installation, at the very least, you should be using a foiled UTP CAT6. And in a residential environment, it may be acceptable to utilize a CAT5E solution, uh, only in so much as most residential environments, we don't have the amount of wireless access points and radios and noise in your house that you do in an office location. And some of those cables um, are, are, you should be selecting cables based on their performance capability. We have cables that are optimized for all of those. So let's wrap this up and we'll open the floor to any questions for the final uh, five to 10 minutes that we'll have here. First and foremost, in any commercial application, once again, HD base T should be run using a, that should be an FUTP, my apologies for making it S, an FUTP CAT6. That's your baseline, but you once again can utilize um, a UUTP discontinuous shield CAT6A, and that has been approved by HD base T. Uh, LLC. HD Base T supports as many as eight hops, and each hop can be up to 100 meters. Or in the case of HD Base T Lite, it can be 60 meters over this category cable, keeping in mind that we have to be thinking in terms of bandwidth and that this system does not go on the LAN but is a point to point extension using a um, structured cabling solution that is, in many ways, identical to what we would install for a LAN. By the way, if you're doing a retrofit, you cannot do HD base T over a low skew or no skew CAT 5D. So if you put in a low skew so that you could extend analog video in past years, utilizing a balance for VGA, you cannot use that for HD base T because HD base T really is data, not the same thing as the analog video signals we discussed at the beginning of this. Understand that when you're looking at HD base T, it inherently supports five play which means that the system supports digital video up to Ultra HD in a 420 color space, embedded digital audio, digital control, including USB, CEC, infrared capabilities, and RS-232, fast Ethernet, speed up to 100 megabits per second, and POH, or power over HD base T, a variation of PoE four pair. Every product doesn't support all of the five elements but all of the five elements can be supported by HD Base T. So just like when you buy a car, pick the feature set that you want and drive away happy, knowing it'll work on the roads that you're going to drive on. HD Base T supports 4K Ultra HD, the next generation in video. How important is 4K? Well, recently Sony announced that they're not making any more 1080p panels. Next year, it'll be a 4K world entirely. HD Base T supports this 4K video. 2160p in the 420 color space. Important to keep in mind, if you do have an installation that specifically requires advanced resolutions in a 444 color space, we have other solutions we should be looking at. HD Base T is power over HD Base T, and it's based on PoE four pair standards, and our HD Base T Caligo solutions can even leverage fiber links. So I guess technically there would be HD Base T, do the HB, HB base F. With that, I'd like to open the floor to any questions that we may have. Perhaps we can also pick a winner of that HD base T solution. All right. Thank you, Joe. It was a great presentation. Uh, like Joe said, we're ready for questions. So, a reminder there's a question box at the bottom. Uh, go ahead and fill that out if you, if you have a question. We do have some in the queue. Uh, so, Joe, how is HD base T different than point uh, than a point to point connection like Legrand's own Rapid Run? So, how is HD base T different than something like Rapid Run? You know, that's a really good question. So, our Rapid Run is an optical solution. It utilizes six channels of multi mode fiber with embedded pixel lasers. It doesn't use your standard multi mode that you would buy on the spool. This is a, a completed device with an HDMI connector on each end. Rapid Run Optical is capable of significantly higher bandwidth than HD Base T. So, if you had solutions where you said, look, I understand in this particular college application or this particular business application, I have to have scalability. 
to 4K in a 4444 environment, uh, possibly at some future point to 8K video, because we're thinking in terms of 10 years out. And I have to go farther than 100 meters. Maybe I have to go 200 or 250 or even 300 meters, 1,000 feet out. You can do that over rapid run optical. So it works very, very well with those long distances where I have to go from a single device to a single device. HD Base T, on the other hand, is optimized to go up to 100 meters over a category cable utilizing a structural wiring solution that is similar to what we would have on the LAN. It has some limited capability utilizing, for instance, the Legrand um, HD Base T um, uh, matrix selector to take a signal and send it to multiple output devices, four, six, or eight, or whatever the number might be, uh, while remaining off the land. So they're, they're both excellent solutions. And think about them as, if, you know, if you're going out to buy a car, well, you're going to decide to buy a sedan or a truck. What are you going to be doing with a car? You should be giving the same thought to HD Base T versus something like a single point solution, such as Rapid Run. What do you want to accomplish? And uh, if you have questions, we'll be able to have to help you with that. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, here's another one. How will GPON and HD Base T work together? Um, that's a, kind of an interesting question, and I'm not sure what you mean about how they will work together. Um, uh, perhaps you can give me a, a better example of um, what you anticipate being the issue there. With yeah, GPON. maybe. I have not. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Maybe we can clarify that with, with Sam a little bit later. Um, what is your opinion on the cost value of STP versus fiber for less than 100 meters? Well, there's no question about it that if we start looking at going to fiber, we're going to increase the cost of the transmit and receive ends on both, on both sides of the equation significantly. So staying with copper for runs under 100 meters can actually be beneficial in many ways. Um, of course, the exception to that is when you start looking at integrated cables that utilize fiber um, you know, and, and, and we're not talking about buying transceivers at both ends or something along those lines. So the, the, the biggest advantage, of course, to fiber is I don't have to worry about things like ground loops. I don't have to worry about things like uh, RFI or EMI because we're dealing with pulses of light and they're relatively impervious to environmental um, inclusion. When we're talking about copper, we do have to worry about putting the system together properly, which I don't think is, is too much of a challenge for most of us on, on this webinar. Um, so in that said, it really comes down to if I had to have a system that was scalable to the ultimates in resolutions, if I had to have the most bandwidth possible and if budget wasn't a consideration, um, I would opt for fiber where I could do that. I've yet to have too many opportunities where the client has said money is no, no object. Okay, great. And Sam did have a clarification. He was just asking if they are able to work together, GPON and HD Base T. So passive optical network, networking is where I'm assuming that we're going with this. And once again, when we're right. talking about HD Base T, we are talking about a specific point-to-point -point solution that's designed to handle uh, a TMDS signal describing digital video as opposed to a, a more open opportunity. Uh, yeah, it's true to say that when we get to that point where we have very, very wide bandwidth networking capabilities, we're measuring bandwidth not in a few gigabits per second, but in terabits per second, the equation changes. Once again, that's I think that's a future technology, and it's a very interesting uh, conversation, a very interesting way to look at the, the way things are going to be installed. But from the context of 2016, I think we still have uh, at least five, maybe eight years, um, where everything is going to be copper-centric, particularly when we start talking about how do I extend the signal from a conference table to a projector at a length of um, 100 feet or 150 feet or 200 feet, as opposed to how do I distribute extremely wide bandwidth content to multiple locations across a campus or in a large building. There are two very, very different problems that we have to look at. HD base T is an HDMI cable extender that allows us to go up to 100 meters over multiple hops and allows us to go to multiple destinations from a single source, and it does not utilize the OSI model or reside on the LAN in any way. Okay, great. We are just about out of time. Um, I wanted to remind everyone to download their Bixie credit. Simply click on the ribbon icon at the bottom of your screen to do that, and we'll leave the session open a little bit longer for you to complete that. Also excited to announce the, uh, the TrueLink HD Base T receiver kit. The $500 value goes to Yamba's Blackburn. So we will contact you um, to, uh, to get that out to you. And 
like I said, we're we're just out of time. So if we didn't get to your question, we will have a Grave Our Sales Rep follow up with you. As a reminder, this presentation will be archived on Graver.com, and um, we hope you can join us next month for the next YouTube talk. Thanks again, Joe. Thank you, and thank you everyone for taking time out of your busy day to join us on this HD-based T webinar hosted by Graybar, and I hope to see you again in a future G2 opportunity.